Welcome to Aesthetics Mastery, the podcast to help you thrive and raise the bar in your aesthetics practice. I'm Dr. Adam Chong. And I'm Dr. Tim Pierce. Dr. Tim Pierce is a GP, founder and director of Skin Viva and Skin Viva Training. Dr. Adam is also a GP and aesthetic trainer and clinician at Skin Viva Training. So Tim, it's been a little while since we've done one of these, um, so it's great to be back. Yeah, summer yes. is over, all the is holidays this? done. Yeah, this room's a lot cooler now, though, which is one good thing. Yes, that does help. Uh, you've been a very busy man, as usual. What, what have you been up to? Do you know, it's all blurred into one. I, I have been... It, it started with a Roger Killer training day that, that... I remember that knocked my week off kilter, and I, I never haven't caught up since. I've just been one thing after the next. And, of course, we've got other duties in life, like being a dad and all that sort of stuff that mm-hmm. also takes up really important time. So, yeah, it's been... And then we had the mindset conference as well, which was yeah. uh, this weekend. There was a lot of build up to that. Um, How did that go? I did a public speaking course with some of the other Allegan um, men- mentees for Maritza de Maya. Oh, wow. Yeah, there's been tons of stuff, but you do it to yourself. You always think when you put in your diary, that won't be that bad. And then suddenly you're like pinballing through life. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, it was, it's, been, it's been really good. Uh-huh. How, how was the, uh, the mindset? Um, Cliff Jump Academy. It was amazing. Um, anyone who's not a member and wants to get involved in the kind of psychology of of um, how to push yourself beyond things you've not done before, you know, mm-hmm. setting up a business is all that kind of thing. And mm-hmm. even if you work for someone else, it's the the new things that you have to do on a daily basis. The mm-hmm. kind of getting out of your comfort zone. Um, that uh, if you look for mindset warriors, you'll find that. And it was yeah, it was amazing. We've had huge response from the people who've done it. Where people are are taking really big strides in their business. It's really amazing to see, to be honest, and amazing stories from it as well. So really, you know, people really opened up and told us what they were afraid of and, and how their business fitted in with their life. And yeah, it was incredible. Really Great. good. That's good to hear. Uh, I, I was down in London just yesterday for a, a conference, a Tioxane conference. And um, with regards to the podcast, I had some, some great feedback. I even had a couple of people come up to me while I was waiting in the queue for food just saying, you know, congrats on the podcast. I found it really useful. So that was really nice to get some some positive feedback there. That's amazing, yeah, um, great to hear. So yeah, it'd be great great to keep this up and just do some topics that are really useful for people, which brings us on to today. So we did um, post just yesterday about um, what people would like us to cover, and it was Botox complications. So we've actually had quite a few questions come in, so if I could put them to you, Tim, and perhaps together we could could go through some of them yeah there's so many that we probably can do it maybe we'll do we'll do something else next week and then come back to it do a couple more because there's there's lots of questions you feel we might end up on a a tangent as usual well you could you could talk all about one of these in one session if you wanted to but let's uh you could (laughs) (laughs) okay let's start with uh, sarah who has asked three questions and the first one is when to not treat heavy lids so this would be, um, d- d- is she meaning, so you're looking at your untreated client and you're thinking, hang on, they have quite heavy eyelids. Should I not treat? Yeah. So the, f- the first thing to do is to break down um, exactly what is causing the, he- the heavy eyelid. Yeah. So is this, because um, some you can see young people who just have, they just don't have a, a fold above their eyelids. So their skin flows continuously from the forehead all the way to the eyelashes and mm-hmm. there's no interruption. Yeah. Um, that's obviously more common um, with certain ethnicities, and but it's, it's a normal variant. Uh, those people are more, they're, they're definitely more likely to show a drop. Now, the older they are, the more significant it is. So if you're at the upper end of the spectrum and it's you know a 65-year-old lady with, with that exact um, anatomical shape and and there's loose, there's laxity as well, which you need to test in, in, in your examination. And you can sense there's a little bit of weight. A really small amount can can knock them into an unhappy place. So that that type of client, I'd be very careful of. So you're looking for an older person with clear volume loss in the forehead and and loose uh, laxity of their skin that almost the skin looks like it's resting on their eyelashes. Yeah. That's a really important thing to notice before you treat. And for those people, I'd almost uh, not treat the forehead at all. Um, possibly do a little bit in the medial, the middle part, but not. Um, you'd be very careful with those. However, other end of the spectrum, you might have a similar shape, um, kind of structure of the of the face, but it's, you know, it could be someone who wants a brow lift who's 28. Mm-hmm. Um, you're actually not that likely to drop it because it, everything else is quite stable. 
Mm-hmm. So um, th- those are the kind of two ways I'd look at it. But I, th- I think it's older people with that shape you've got to be very careful with, but younger people you can have that same shape structure and not actually have much of a risk of a, of a brow drop. You're still going to inject in a way that's more likely to lift, though. Okay. Um, it's often termed hooding, isn't it? Yes. Because when I read this, heavy lids actually... If we're being a bit pedantic, it's not really the, the eyelid that's heavy. It's the skin above the eye lid that's resting on the eyelid. Yes, which correct. Is hooding, that's isn't a good it? differentiation, yeah. Yeah, and I think people often get confused between the difference between a brow drop and a, and a, li- a heavy lids and a ptosis. Like that sometimes, I know when I was first learning, it took me a while to grasp what the difference was between them. So what we're referring to is that excess skin, that hooding, um, it is like you say it's um, often linked to ethnicity but as you age you said that the forehead loses volume which can also cause more of a drop of, the, of that skin and you said test the um, whether there's loose skin as well so does that does that indicate that someone could be at high risk of getting a drop yeah um, so skin laxity is one thing that makes it high risk that's obviously mainly associated with age um, volume loss um, the other thing would be if you're hyperdynamic normally, so as, as in you're someone who always has their eyebrows up. So I, I even had yes. a strange consultation many years ago with a 15-year-old girl who I didn't treat because she was 15, but she had lines in her forehead already. Wow. Um, and she just had her eyebrows up all the time. Now, if I'd treated her, I probably, you probably could have got rid of the lines, but at the same time, she would have looked a lot heavier than normal. So she may have reported there are people who are hyperdynamic who when you get rid of the lines they're actually quite unhappy because they they now can't lift their eyebrows up and often they do that i think partly because they have skin laxity or not necessarily skin laxity but a kind of a bulky upper eyelid um and so they're compensating for that so is this the compensated brow ptosis that i've heard you mention before is that the term often used for that you're compensating by increasing the resting tone of your frontalis so that it's almost always lifting up yeah uh, like maybe a I don't know if Gordon Ramsay is the best example, but he has that kind of heavy upper eyelid and he uses his forehead a lot. Yeah. So there is there are, it's definitely a type of patient who's doing that because it's annoying not to. Yes. Or they maybe it's not even that they notice it, but there's definitely a, the muscle needs to be more active for them to be happy. So you stop right. the muscle acting and you end up with a, what feels basically like a brow ptosis. Yeah. I think the, the, such a key thing as well is um, informing the patients and explaining why this could potentially cause a heaviness to the brow. I've actually had two, two cases myself recently, and when I reflected back on them, it was just a mild heaviness, but when I looked back at the before photos, I probably shouldn't have treated them. I obviously warned them about it, I used tiny doses. I mean, one lady, I think, used six units in the frontalis. She still came back feeling heavy, and when I look, the hooding was so severe, it was literally touching her eyelashes. Mm. So, of course, I, I think for her, frontalis is just a, a no-go. Yeah, and, and it's that's actually, I mean, that's unfortunately how you learn these things because you learn about it a lot in theory, um, but until you get burned, which is, and it's exactly what you notice, which is if the eyelash is involved in supporting the skin and you drop it even a tenth of a millimeter, yeah. it feels like the weight of the world on your eyelids. So yeah. um, those are the people to be especially careful of. And all it takes, I think, is a, a clinic running slightly late or if you're a bit tired at the end of your clinic and you just don't take the time to look carefully. Yeah, um, it's not. it's often um, when something seems easy that you get into an issue. So um, I remember once it was actually it was someone who, in retrospect, I found out was quite dysmorphic. But she asked for a really simple treatment, and and that was one of those cases where I thought, well, she's got a, a frown line. I can easily solve a frown line. That's <clears> nothing. She had all the indications for it, but I she also wore dark sunglasses to the appointment, which is always um, you know you, you would do wonder how someone's feeling if they're hiding that much. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, but it, because such a simple thing, you do the treatment and then you learn afterwards that you, you can never drop the ball in any of the arenas because you get caught out. But that's, that's, that's how it is in clinical practice. You pick up little things as you go along. I think you were right, Tim, that this, we might have to split this podcast up. <laughs> we're on question one. <laughs> okay. Um, but it's useful though. I think there's some good take homes there yeah. for, for the client selection, which is, which is very hard <clears throat> to teach on training days because you just don't always get all the clients for all the different, um, Mm. indications or reasons not to treat yeah definitely okay so that takes us to uh, question two from sarah which is how to correct a spock brow um, so I'll, I'll take this one if you want so obviously understanding the reasons why people get a spocked brow i guess how, how do you define a spock brow if i can push you on that first because it's so it's called a spock brow i believe because of star trek 
uh, Spock. So it's like a colloquial term, really. Um, and it's, be- it's where the outermost part of the eyebrow is raised rather than sort of the, you know, it's normally like the, in about a centimetre from the outermost part of the brow that should be the, the highest part. So that's a beautiful brow lift. Whereas if it's the outermost part of the brow, it's not a good look. Um, and it looks like Spock from Star Trek. Um, often caused by people trying to do a brow lift, but perhaps they've measured it up wrong and have left too much of the frontalis in the wrong area pulling up. Mm-hmm. Um, so the, the other thing I've noticed is that if you've lost your hair on the lateral part of your eyebrow, you can do everything right and still get a Spock brow. Okay, So have a look at the shape of their eyebrows um, before they come in. Obviously, a lot of people draw them on when they've lost <coughs> that, but if they're not drawing them on, you can end up with a, the tail in the air, okay. even though you've done okay. everything right. Haven't seen that. Okay, that's good to know. So how to correct it? Well, quite simply, um, you need to look where the muscle activity is working. So if it's tugging up in the vector that's causing the spot brow, then we need to put some Botox, I'd say usually at the top of that vector. I think if you go too low, you could perhaps cause a bit of a, a brow drop. So I personally tend to put one somewhere sort of mid-depth, at least two centimetres, maybe two and a half centimetres above your, uh, your orbital rim. So that I'm out of my safety zone, but I'm enough into that frontalis that I'm not going to cause a brow drop. How many units did you say? So I guess it depends. If it's a really, really strong movement, I may put one or two. Um, somewhere between 0.5 to one unit is what I might use. It well, depends on the strength of the muscle. And of course, the thing we're worried about here is, is a brow ptosis. So you just, you're trying to correct too much lift and then you drop it. Um, yeah. So that it's a re- and I say this to patients. This is a, a balancing act. Like it, it could just be a little bit too much, or it may not be quite enough, and you have to come back. So um, they should know that before they have the treatment, which is useful that they understand there's uncertainty there. I think once you've caused a spot brow, it's probably quite hard to then get a beautiful lift, isn't it? Because of effectively you've gone too far lateral with the triangle that you've left free of Botox, mm-hmm. but maybe you've Botoxed a little bit too far along to cause the night the nice lift so you'd probably have to try and flatten the spock brow then next time you could perhaps do the nice lift the other thing is probably worth saying is the type of client who gets these spock brows um they tend to be older people where you can create create more lift because there's less fat reducing the uh, producing resistance to the muscle so you get a more dis- disharmony harmonious um kind of <clears throat> spread of muscle activity yeah um I always think that with all with you know if they if you're 25 and you're doing a brow lift it's actually quite hard to create a spock brow yeah but if you once you're 55 it's a whole different story yeah definitely okay and the next question was why is there a recommended dose per area but then more can be added at top up does this not take you over the recommended dose um so the recommended dose is in is to be safe usually and then to make sure that you're not over treating it's particularly like for, if you take your example of the the spock brow treatment like we have a recommended dose of half to one unit um, that's to be really safe so that you don't cause a drop and you can still unfortunately in the small percentage cause a drop even mm-hmm. from that um, so th- that's the thing you you don't with botox you don't really know what you've done until the receptors have been treated and the muscle has stopped working and then at that point when you retreat it's actually relevant what you've done before because you can see there's muscle movement you shouldn't be treating something where there's no muscle movement mm-hmm. so you can almost forget what you've put in and just treat according to how much muscle movement that you see so recommended dose is to keep your side effects and risks down and of course not to waste product because it is expensive stuff um, and then uh, and then you can adjust according to what it looks like two weeks later it's useful to know for people that there is no active toxin left in your skin at two weeks it's all done its job and it's left i think some people imagine that it's patients especially that it's building up and it's not it's gone so you can retreat i think um, myself and ahmed had read that it was within 20 30 minutes actually the botox has done its cleaving of the, of the protein and then it's uh, sorry the receptors and then it's you know effectively done so all this stuff that we say for the next two days not much evidence to say it'll make that much difference yeah i'm really interested in that <clears throat> side of things that, um because i've because i was always also taught that about so it's the cleaving is that within the time from when it gets into the neuron to when it's done is cleaving or is it from the time from when you inject it until it's done is cleaving good question I, I i don't know i'd have to go back to the paper yeah because i kind of imagine these little molecules floating around in the and in the intracellular fluid yeah uh, extracellular fluid and then they they eventually make it into the cell and then they do their job and it's the the time lapse between injection and getting into the the, ner- the neuron that's that's the important bit um 
I mean, I have a feeling it was 20, 30 minutes from injection because then I've now changed my advice to do those muscle exercises for mm. 20 minutes after injection. Yeah. And then pretty much anything after that doesn't make much difference. So I feel that's probably from something we read, but maybe we could dig that paper out again. Yeah. Fine. Okay. So question from Tracy, should we not be injecting Botox into the over 65s? Um, good question. So this is to do with licensing. So there's a licensed, um, the license for Botox is for up to age 65. So that doesn't mean that you can't do it, but you, you're, in, you're in the realm of off-label, which means you as a clinician are saying, um, there is an established body of evidence and experience that tells me that, that I can make a difference in this case, but I'm not following the manufacturer's guidelines who, haven't, who essentially aren't backing me on this. I'm making the decision and I'm taking the responsibility. That's what off-label basically means. Um, I don't think it's a black and white. It's not, it's certainly not. I've treated people much older than 65 and had a good result. In fact, my oldest client ever was 91 and she had one area of Botox in her frown and it mm -hmm. did the job for her and she was happy. Mm -hmm. Now, what you are at risk of, most importantly, is ptosis is all over the place because the, the muscle is sometimes the only thing supporting the skin uh, after a certain age. So you've got no fat, you've got skin, the breakdown of collagen and elastin is, uh, is quite advanced the older you get. <laughs> Um, and so if you put a little bit too much in, it'll drop. Same reason why you might get a Spock brow. So you can overlift, underlift, um, drop cheeks, um, brows. Uh, and so that's the risk that you're taking is increased chance of dropping. And of course, it may just not cause as much of a difference in improving lines. So it takes a bit of experience. Um, you might keep your doses slightly lower oh, yeah. um, and be careful in areas that can drop. Okay. Um, we've had a few replies to that already. Someone was suggesting... Is 65 significant compared to 64? Well, no, probably 65 is an arbitrary number. I, I'm guessing that Allegan chose to do develop this license up to. It's a bit like not treating the under 18s. I'm sure that plenty of 16, 15 year olds would be fine, but they've chosen they've chosen these arbitrary age gaps. Yeah, They're and eight. whenever you try and convert a person into a number, you risk, um, you know, ignoring the fact that everyone's slightly different. I, I totally agree. I think it's a yeah. good point that there isn't a difference and you'll, you'll find 50 year olds with the same risks as a 65 year old and you'll find 70 year olds with great skin who get a great difference. Yeah. I mean, Joanne has also asked, is it about comorbidities? I'd say probably not for, for Botox because there's not many comorbidities that would be a contraindication to, to I Botox. I agree. Yeah. yeah. Okay, um, I've got time for a couple more. Um, so Elaine has asked if you could show typical reasons why clients aren't satisfied and what you can do at the top of appointment, that would be helpful. And El Elaine is a newbie. Okay, typical reasons why clients aren't satisfied. Um, the, I, if I try and put myself back to 10 years ago and think what, what as a newbie, the kind of things that would come back that might be quite useful. Um, the first thing is when you're new, you've got a lot to remember and you don't always remember to paint the path ahead um, or you don't have a great customer service team like we have who can help on the other end if you forget to say something. But um, probably one of the worst mistakes I'd make is not telling them that it takes two weeks to kick in. Um, and then they, they have their injections, they're all excited and they, and they can't tell a difference. Mm. <laughs> so um, make sure that you tell them you need to wait. And this is importantly phrased two weeks for the muscle to fully relax and then it might take longer to get the full result on your skin because all that Botox does is relax muscle. Mm -hmm. A lot of people think it's a skin treatment and you're going to magically make their skin look better. <clears throat> you're just allowing their skin to recover. So it's important to tell them that in the consultation yep. and the lines will start to fade. They fade probably quickest in the forehead. Maybe crow's feet can fade quite quickly in some people and maybe a little bit slow around frown lines um, because you haven't got gravity helping in that area. Yeah, if I could just add to that, actually, that I've seen quite a few people who came in, for example, a frown line at rest, who had some treatment, but then never came back for uh, 12, 18 months. And, and they said, yeah, it didn't really work that well. So I think explaining to people that repeated treatments, because they're not going to see the effects on the resting skin straight away, that that line will get softer and softer as you stop that muscle movement. That's a key thing, which is also good for client retention. They, they need to come back to see you in three months for the best results but also so they, they understand that that's, that's necessary and yes. that, it, that it hasn't been a failure of treatment. Absolutely. That's a good point. If it's a deep line anyway. Um, a few others. Um, usually there's, it, the other one would be that you've done the correct dose, but there's a little bit more movement. And that's the most common reason people come back is they can see some movement in the place where they weren't expecting movement. And once again, you can take that back to the consultation and make sure that people are not expe expecting the outcome to be zero movement because zero movement doesn't look good. Mm -hmm. So what we want is that you have that movement that goes where you need to soften the line. 
Um, so frown, if you take your frown line, for example, is quite, exa- quite a good example because yeah. if you stop your glabella from moving, your corrugator muscle and your procerus, and you go and look in the mirror and you try and test that and you try hard enough, you will recruit orbicularis oculi and start to create movement. And so sometimes people come back for what I call the Botox test face mm-hmm. treatment rather than actually stop, stopping you from frowning. Mm-hmm. And you just need to show them that. Most people are reasonable, say... You, you are getting movement, but look how much you're using the muscle around your eye, which I can't Botox. Yeah. Um, and that usually is enough for them. So just do a normal frown and you'll see, you'll see no lines. Yeah. Um, similar with the forehead, there are, there are things, sometimes you can, you can use another close by muscle to, to get something to work, or you're, you're, you're doing a face that isn't really what the purpose of the treatment is. Often, um, often so bunny yeah. lines are recruited, aren't they, when people try and frown? Yeah, which is something that people aren't used to using, and all. and also people I think look very closely at the face when they've had any aesthetic treatment, so they then start to pick up on other things, yeah. which is why before photos are absolutely key as well. Absolutely, I've got endless anecdotes of people spotting things that were there before. It's mm-hmm. very normal. The more nervous, the more likely that that, that they will do that. Yeah. Other reasons, I mean, we've mentioned. Heavy, uh, heaviness, which is obviously important just to look at client selection there and dosing. Wearing off, wearing off too soon. Yeah, so that depends. Um, now, particularly if you're, now there is a, a financial driver here for to use as little as possible, which is reasonable. Like we shouldn't put more in than we think we need just, just to prevent follow-ups. You should try and get it right. Mm-hmm. Um, but if you're squeezing yourself on dosages, and you'll, you'll note whenever you see three areas for, you know, hundred pounds or something which people do get to there's no way that they're using the correct dose because you, you just physically couldn't pay for that yeah. so um if you, you it's important for new clinicians not to be focused too much on price and to get the right amount of product in and make sure that that's covered for otherwise what you end up doing is is doing kind of maybe the licensed dose and frown and crow's feet and then you're, you're really scraping the barrel to treat the forehead and those people will come back so are you using the right dose maybe it's just because you're scared because you don't want to cause a brow ptosis and you're putting in four units and they actually need 10 mm-hmm. or 12 um so that could be one reason why people are coming back um other one is that we also don't like we've already discussed with brow ptosis you don't want to inject too low down in the forehead otherwise you'll end up um, with more chance of a, of a drop so if you inject too high you also preserve too much movement even if you put a good dose in so that can be another reason that you need to do a follow-up appointment yeah the other thing i would just say to elaine is that um botox often can you can start to get some movement back at the eight week point we're not saying full movement but it's quite normal i believe to get some movement back at around eight nine ten weeks so that doesn't mean it's failed that can just be normal variants of it um, Botox does last different lengths of time for some people, but just uh, if I if you explain that to your client when that movement starts to come at, at that twitch at eight weeks, then they'll be expecting it and they won't be calling you expecting mm-hmm. some free treatments at that point. There's actually a great graph I've seen shared online a few times of the the peak of muscle relaxation happening around kind of two to three weeks or something, and mm-hmm. then it, it almost immediately starts tailing off. Right. So it's not it's not a flat line and then it drops at four weeks. It's <coughs> it's fr- me. pretty much as soon as it's worked to its maximum, it starts to wear off. Okay. Which is exactly kind of what you'd expect. Yeah. Because that's how most things work in the body. So, but it's you usually don't notice it for a, you know for a good few months and then suddenly at like two and a half months in, you can see it starting to soften again. That period of time can get longer as the muscle gets thinner though. So that's another thing to tell your patient on the first time is. Okay, it's wearing off at eight weeks this time, slightly. Mm-hmm. Um, maybe next time it will, you'll get to nine or ten weeks um, if you do it on time. Yeah. Uh, the other thing which I've often noticed people come, especially if they're, they're newbies to Botox, is some people don't like the feeling it leaves on the forehead. Not necessarily if they've had it frozen, it's just that feeling. I think some people say it feels like they're wearing a cap or it feels tight. And it's just a new feeling. They've never not been able to move their frontalis in, in that in, in such a way before so again to warn them that they might feel some odd sensations it might feel a bit heavy or tight for a few days that may just prevent that 10 p.m phone call on a mm. sunday evening someone worried that it's i think it's happening. so true i think also if it happens and you're not expecting it you feel it feel you feel out of control and that's like you don't want that again whereas if you're expecting it it feels more tolerable yeah absolutely okay um i think we may have to wrap up this episode but as you said tim we're going to have to do this in several parts i think because we've only got through three questions <laughs> well no three different people we've answered about six questions there but, okay um, well that's great we've got more to answer next week and we'll, we we'll have keep lots going through them yeah we do um if you do have any more botox uh, complication questions then please do post them online and we'll do our best to answer them in the coming weeks 
Um, was there anything else you wanted to mention today, Tim? No, nothing else. I hope you guys have enjoyed that. If you... Oh, there was the, the YouTube video. That was the thing I wanted to Oh, of to... course. Yeah. So if you, that's really important, actually. That if you guys want to know more about brow toasters, we have a we have a free video on the Skin Viva Training website, um, Skin Viva Training YouTube website, um, which basically talks about brow toasters in quite a lot of detail. It's been viewed quite a long time, quite a lot of times, and that mm-hmm. might help. Um, the next thing is we are also launching a cadaver course uh, for complications from dermal filler, and that's going to be 17th and 18th of November if you save the date. Um, although we haven't yet got that available to book online yet, just because of technical. Um, issues but 17th and 18th of November Keele University will be doing our first cadaver course which should be fun fantastic okay well thank you very much for listening and uh, we'll be back very soon great thank you all for watching and listening Mm -hmm.